as we're paddling along, people on the shore always hail us and, you know, say, where are you going? Where are you from? What are you doing? And we, as a joke, we'd say, we're going to New Orleans. And they, you know, drop their jaws. But then after we had said that enough times, I think we started to believe it, that we really were. From the river to the valley to the sea. Welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler Podcast. I'm Dean Klinkenberg, and I've been exploring the deep history and rich culture of the people and places along America's greatest river, the Mississippi, since 2007. Join me as I go deep into the characters and places along the river, and occasionally wander into other stories from the Midwest and other rivers. Read the episode show notes and get more information on the Mississippi at MississippiValleyTraveler.com. Let's get going. Welcome to episode 51 of the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast. Well, today we're going to be talking paddling again, and, and this one I'm really excited to bring you. Um, so many of the experiences we hear about folks who paddle the Mississippi uh, are from people who attempt to do the whole river in a, a single trip. So they may take 10 weeks, 12 weeks, maybe a little bit longer, uh, and paddle from source to sea all in one shot. Well, on the show today, I've got Ann Shervey Osi, who paddled the Mississippi River in its entirety, but by doing it one week at a time with friends. So it took them, uh, I think, 13 trips uh, beginning in 2004, uh, and they managed to uh, see the entire Mississippi from the headwaters to the Gulf. So in this episode, uh, Anne shares her experiences doing that and how those trips came about, uh, a few of the things they did to prepare for that trip. Uh, she shares a couple of stories of uh, things that happened to them along the way. Of course, there have always got to be a couple of good stories. But we also talk more generally about her interest in the outdoors, how she got interested in outdoors in the first place, uh, the work that she's done, um, uh, taking kids out uh, on uh, camp, you know, multi-day camping trips and what she learned from, uh, from those trips and uh, the kinds of kids that she got out in the woods. Just uh, it's a very interesting, you know, conversation about her life experiences and her experiences with the outdoors and with paddling specifically. So uh, enjoy it. Uh, I know this gives me hope that maybe someday I'll be able to see the entire Mississippi from the seat of a canoe. Uh, but I probably will be like her and it'll be by doing a series of trips rather than one long shot. Well, as always, thanks to those of you who show me some love through Patreon. You not only keep this podcast going, you make me smile. If you want to join the Patreon community, you can go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg, and uh, you can join it there for as little as a dollar a month. And what that gets you right now is early access to each of these podcast episodes. Don't really like the Patreon thing? Well, you can buy me a coffee. So uh, go to mississippivalleytraveler.com slash podcast, and you'll find a link there to feed my caffeine habit, which also makes me smile. At that same link, mississippivalleytraveler.com slash podcast, you'll also find the show notes and a list of all of the previous 50 episodes. So go to town, binge them, spend, uh, spend a couple days going through all these episodes and learning all you can about the Mississippi River. And now, on with the interview. Ann Shervey Osi is uh, has led an adventurous life, uh, and we're here to hear more stories about that today, particularly as they relate to the Mississippi. She's lived and worked internationally. She's worked as a teacher and as a wilderness guide, uh, and she has had some remarkable long-distance paddling trips, and that's really what caught my attention, and we'll be digging into that in just a little bit. But, uh, but first, welcome to the Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast, Ann. Thank you, Dean. It is an honor to be on your show here. You know, it is such a, it's a delight to talk to you. I, and, um, one of the things that got my attention, and I think this probably just uh, um, speaks to me because I probably will do something similar. It, I like that your approach that you were able to paddle the entire Mississippi, but you did it in segments rather than trying to conquer it all at once. 
So, so we'll come back to that a little bit later, but for now, I'm just sort of curious how you got so hooked on the outdoors. Like, were you uh, active with outdoor stuff when you were growing up? Well, when I was a kid, we always went camping because we were kind of poor. And if we wanted a vacation, it was a camping vacation. And then um, in high school, I always liked to go camping and hiking and stuff. But my high school friends weren't really into that kind of thing. So I, I did stuff with my brothers um, quite a bit. And I did stuff by myself quite a bit. Then when I got to college, I found people who had similar interests. So when did you get interested in kind of doing these longer trips, uh, multi-day, you know, camping and paddling? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I at one point I worked for Outward Bound, and that was our modus operandi. It was to take um, basically a month out of people's lives and be in the wilderness with them. So multi-day trips... Um, I've done forever. I I love camping. I love the camping part. It's the funnest part. And so if I can camp for weeks on end, it's like being in heaven. <laughs> what is it you enjoy so much about the camping experience? You know, I think I was thinking about this the other day. I think it's just getting to a place and kind of making it your own and you know, setting up your tent and it's, it's like playing house here. The kitchen's going to be here. And, uh, you know, the, the good view is over here and the bathroom's back there. And it's just like a new, you're moving into a new house every day. And I just think that's fun. Yeah. That, and you can choose wherever you want to build your house too, I guess. Right. Yep. Um, so, it, it seems like you've kind of had this mix where you, you've you had sort of, let's say, the recreational interest in being doing things outdoors, but you've also had these jobs that allowed you to do uh, some of that professionally, like with Outward Bound. Um, mm-hmm. I read the, on your website that you, you took some kids up to the Boundary Waters for a week-long trip and then had them um, use art to express their feelings about the trip. Yeah, this is when I was teaching at a community college. And... Um, we offered this Boundary Waters trip as a humanities class. Um, I didn't, I wasn't qualified to be, to have it be a PE class. So we, we had the students interpret the Boundary Waters through um, poetry, drawing, sculpting, um, music, what, whatever they wanted to, um, however they wanted to do it in a fine arts kind of way. So it put a little different um, tilt to the trip because they were always trying to look for creative things, which I, I thought um, was a good challenge for them. Were they kids that had some experience with the outdoors like that, or was it mostly new for them? Or It was mostly new. Yeah, none of them had ever been to the Boundary Waters. Now, they might have been camping before, but... The Boundary Waters is kind of a unique spot in the world. So um, a lot of people's idea of camping is, you know, driving someplace and and getting out and setting your tent up on the gravel. But um, as far as the expedition part of it, no, that that was totally new. Mm -hmm. What uh, what kinds of things do they express about the experience? And what did they what did their art uh, artwork tell you about their experiences? Um, one of the things they had to do was keep a journal. And um, that gave us really, uh, it was really an eye opener into what they were going through. And most of them changed a lot from the beginning, which, you know, was kind of like, this is stupid. And um, to the end where they were appreciating their environment a little bit more. But they also, you know, some people were natural um, artists of the, you know, art of painting and drawing. And they came up with some really nice, nice stuff. Um, The music part, I was the music teacher in this outfit. And 
no one, no one would do a music project because it was too hard. Except, except what they would do sometimes is write a song and then the whole group would sing it. And that, that was fine. Oh yeah. That's fun too. Yeah. Um, so I guess the big question is, would any of those kids ever go back to camping that way again in the future? Or? <laughs> no, I think, I think some of them would, some of them would, would never, ever do it again. But yeah, I think for a lot of them, especially because of the beauty of the Boundary Waters, I think they, um, were touched in a way that they hadn't been before. And I, I expect mm. to go back. So I, kind of based on your experiences then with Outward Bound and with uh, that Boundary Waters trip and all, and all the work that you've done, like what have you found uh, has been sort of a, um, an entry point for getting kids who may not have a lot of background with the or outdoors interested in that? Mm. Well, you have to really sell them on the fun part. It's really, really going to be fun. And you, you can be with your friends and all that in the middle of a, sweaty swampy portage that you know they don't um realize the fun aspect of it but um you know you you say oh you're we're gonna have campfires every night and cook cook it around the campfire and fish and swim and and all those things do come true I, you just don't tell them about the bad parts that are going to happen the rain and the uh, bugs and the swamps and right you you can't lead with those long sweaty portages and mosquitoes like you you gotta maybe they maybe they can find out more about that once they're there yeah then then i say oh oh i forgot to tell you about that that's uh that's just a one of the side aspects of it it's you know it's not that important <laughs> So has paddling always been part of your outdoors experience then? Like, were you interested in canoeing or kayaking kind of from a fairly young age too? Or yeah, My family had a canoe, um, but I grew up in North Dakota. So canoeing in North Dakota is kind of different from, from canoeing in Minnesota. I mean, you have these very sluggish green rivers and that's what you can canoe on. But I, I learned to canoe there and then, you know, I was, I was very comfortable in the canoe. And then um, when I got to college, I started working at different camps and um, that where canoeing was the main mode of transportation. And um, yeah, I just, it just grew from there, but I, I felt like I had a good basis before I ever started doing that. Uh, do you consider yourself like a more of a canoe person or more of a kayak person at this point? Mm -hmm more of a canoe person yeah me too but um yeah you can't carry very much stuff and you know you have to portage your own boat all the time when you're kayaking so i guess i like the camaraderie of canoeing also mm -hmm. but when i can't find a friend kayaking is fine i take my dog yeah good companion out there on the water Yep. So when did you get the idea to start paddling the Mississippi? Well, my friend who had been my college roommate um, called me in 2003 and asked me if I wanted to canoe um, to the Twin Cities from Itasca. And I said, sure. And we didn't have a plan at that time to go past the Twin Cities. And it took us four years of a week, a year to get there. And then um, because I was from Iowa, I said, let's just go, go some more till we get to Iowa. And they said, okay. So we went a couple more years. And then one of, one of the girls had lived in St. Louis and she said, let's just go to St. Louis because I got a lot of friends there and, but I don't want to go any bit past St. Louis because it's hot and buggy and the river's terrible. And we said, okay, we'll just go to St. Louis. So we got to St. Louis and, and then the first friend and I started making plans for going on. And 
the one that wanted to stop at St. Louis kind of said, hey, wait for me. <laughs> she joined us and then we kept going. It just kind of morphed into doing the whole thing. So it didn't start as a grand plan to do the whole river one week at a time or? No, but um, as we're paddling along, people on the shore always hail us and you know say, where are you going? Where are you from? What are you doing? And we, as a joke, we'd say, we're going to New Orleans. And they, you know, drop their jaws. But then after we had said that enough times, I think we started to believe it, that we really were. <laughs> so what year was that first week on the river? 2004. 2004. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. So that first week was from Itasca to, uh, how far did you get that first week then? The um cast cast lake cast lake i think that's where it was it's a tough stretch anyway yeah there were trees across the whole river and oh, a bunch of old wrecked dams and yeah it was shallow and it's kind of like paddling in north dakota actually <laughs> <laughs> so you were right at home then i guess <laughs> Um, so the week were most of the paddle trips in about a week long. Yeah, a, a week or eight days because we all had jobs. Mm -hmm. um, two of us were teachers, so we had the summers off. But the third one um, was a nurse, and she only got a week off. Right. So we had to accommodate her. So what did you have to do to prep for for the for those week long trips? Well, food was a big thing. And it's looking back now, it's really uh, things changed so much because we used to cook with a fire and a, and a cook kit every night. And, and lately, when we've been paddling lately, we have um, dehydrated meals in a bag and never even have a fire unless there's a reason to. And we started out with aluminum canoes and, um, you know, then we progressed to Kevlar. We started out with no cell phones and um, ended up with satellite phones and Garmin's and stuff. So the the overall flavor changed a lot in those 13 years. But preparation, my husband always said, you are either planning your trip or you're paddling, or you're planning for the next trip. That's all you do. Because <laughs> yeah. we, you know, we have to plan how we're going to get there, how we're going to get home, who's going to do what, whose canoes we're going to use, who's going to bring what food. And um, one, one of the girls, the one that lived in St. Louis, hadn't been canoeing before. So she was a, a total novice. Um, so we had to you know, kind of accommodate that. But by the end, she was she was great. How many of you would would it be three of you generally that would be doing those week long trips then? Three of us always. And then sometimes we'd bring other people who were interested. So we sometimes we'd have one canoe. Sometimes we'd have two canoes, three canoes, two canoes in the kayak, just depending on who wanted to go. Most people, though, after they went one year, they said, thank you. And thank you. Didn't want to go. It takes a certain kind of person who thinks that's it's fun to be dirty and sweaty all the time. I mean, I. I can tell I can tell talking to people immediately if they would work or not work with. And when you um, you asked me earlier, um, that's the main thing that I learned is that you have to paddle with people that you get along with and that you like. Because if you are stuck in a boat or on a trip with with people you can't stand, it just will never work. Right. I mean, you probably have to abort the trip. And And the three of us that did this Mississippi all the whole thing 
never, well, I should say rarely got into a fight. And if we did, it was about some really stupid thing, but never, never totally at odds about anything. So did you pick up any tips about how to screen people for that? I mean, apart from the, like the three of you, like, like, cause I, I, when I think about that, it's like, I've got some friends that I get along really well with, but there's no guarantee that we would be compatible on a trip like that. Right. Um, well, no, we didn't have a screening method, but <laughs> whatever friend it was, you would say, oh yeah, so-and-so is really wants to go and she's really fun and she, she would do blah, 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 blah. So the rest of us just kind of buy into it. And usually that worked okay. One time it, it was a disaster, just a total disaster. And that was my friend. Um, so I, it was my fault. But um, luckily she only, she only was with us for half of the week. And then she was going to trade places with another person. So after three days, we switched and it, then everything was good. <laughs> It, it, I think uh, for folks who've never done anything like that, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to picture what the experience is going to be like, because like you said, you, there are no showers available and uh, you may be using, you know, your, your toilets may be sandbars. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of folks are used to their daily comforts. Yeah. You just have to um, acknowledge that you're not going to have any daily comforts. You're not going to have running water. You're not going to have soap. You're not going to have, TV, you're not going to have music on your iPads, but but you have all this other stuff that takes the place. If you can, if the person is flexible and open to new experiences, they'll be fine. Fantastic, yeah. Um, what do you think are some of the like core skills that you figured people really need to have or learn quickly for a trip like that? Well, first of all, they need to, someone in the group needs to be able to read a map and, and you can say, well, you just follow the river. You just go downstream, but it's not always that easy. There's a, there's some places where you are in a maze of islands and um, <laughs> you don't have a clue if, you, if you're not looking at the map. Um, you have to have someone in the stern which is the back of the canoe, who knows what they're doing, because it can be, um, it can be dangerous on that river. And you don't really realize it because you're moving at the same speed as the water. So you don't, you don't realize the force um, that you have until you run up against something that's not moving. And, and then, you know, it's like, whoa, that was a, um, a disaster in the making. So you have to have someone who can steer away from those potential problems. I'm 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 very leery of people who just who don't know how to canoe and just say we're just going to float the river because um that's not the Mississippi is not a river you should float. There there's it's too big and there's too much going on on it. Yeah, that's a that's a, a debate I have with some friends of mine who I think we've been out on the river three times for overnight trips, at least a couple of nights minimum. Mm -hmm. And they always refer to these experiences as float trips. And uh, it's like, no, <laughs> this isn't the Merrimack River or, you know, the Apple River or, you know, these this is a paddle trip. This is an expedition. You have to pay attention. And yeah, one of the things on the Mississippi that I had no idea about before we started was the wing dams. Um, and even when people told us, watch out for the wing dams, we didn't know what they were talking about. But um, these are man-made structures that are built to divert the water away from the shore. So the erosion isn't such a problem. And if you if they're if the water's low, you see these structures. If the water's high, you float over them without even noticing. But if the water's right in the middle, you you get caught in the boils of these, and 
it can spin your canoe around in half a second. And if you're not paying attention or someone in the boat isn't paying attention, um, you could swamp just in the blink of an eye. So from, from your experience on these trips, like other than like, you know, the, the wing dams, what, what were some of the primary dangers you were really watching out for when you were on the river? Um, floating objects like trees and cars, picnic tables, but you were going the same speed as they are. We were paddling several years when it was flood stage and the river was closed to all barge traffic, which was really nice for us because we could go wherever we wanted and not worry about anything. But um, you try to find a campsite when it's flooded like that and you're over along the edge and you're paddling through the forest trying to find a place, you know, that looks like it could, uh, you could crawl out and set up a tent there. And that, that even that is dangerous paddling through the trees because, you know, you don't have any idea what's underneath there. So I liked the flood stage, but it, I, it was kind of dangerous. We liked the, the drought years too, because there are sandbars everywhere. And you just, um, I mean, from one spot on the river, you could see camp and it was time to camp yeah who needs those gulf coast beaches when you've got the sandbars on the mississippi right yeah yeah and they're full of um tracks all kinds of tracks and turtle eggs and fish skeletons and snake skins it's just a bounty of of stuff to to look at on these sandbars. The only so thing is, your, oh, go ahead. The, the water uh, sometimes wasn't as pleasant as the Pacific Ocean, maybe, as far as cleanliness. But that didn't stop us very often. Right. And mostly it's just sediment, but occasionally, if you're downriver of a sewer pipe, that's probably not the best place to go mm -hmm. for a swim. Mm -hmm. When we were going through Minneapolis, we saw some some pipes coming out into the water of the grossest looking stuff. And it looked like it had not been um, filtered or tended in any way. It was just this gooky stuff coming out. It was pretty horrible. Yeah. Unfortunately, we still have too much of that, but... Uh... I think people still assume the river is a polluted mess all the way, but that certainly hasn't been my experience. No, no. Um, even be, below um, St. Louis, where we thought it was going to be really gross, the only places it was really bad was in the locks. When, because they kind of catch everything. And... Mm -hmm. um, and then once you're through the lock, then it's nice, like fresh water again. Hey, Dean Klinkenberg here, interrupting myself. Just wanted to remind you that if you'd like to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler Guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that is set in places along the Mississippi. My newest book, the wild Mississippi goes deep into the world of Old Man River. Learn about the varied and complex ecosystems supported by the Mississippi, the plant and animal life that depends on them, and where you can go to experience it all. Find any of these wherever books are sold. So what was the, what were your days like on this? Did you have like a, a general goal for like a, a time you were trying to get on the water and a time you're, a day you were shooting for being off the water? Oh, we'd try to be on the water by seven for sure because it's so pretty in the morning and not so hot and the birds are making a terrific racket early in the morning. And and then we would try to hug the 
hugged the shore so we were in the shade till about 10. And then we would maybe eat lunch at 11 or so and and then paddle again till probably 3.30 or 4. And we didn't set out, you know, we didn't say, okay, we're at this town and we're going to get to this town today because things always happen. But we would have, I mean, we knew where we thought we were going to end up at the end of the week. So, um, you know, we space out the, we know we had to do, you know, 25 miles this day or, so we had a good idea, but then you never know where you're going to camp either. Sometimes you'd look for a campsite for hours, especially on those flood years. Right. Not so many dry patches of land uh, to, to camp on when the river was high like that. Yeah. Um, can I tell you one story about that? Oh, absolutely. Um, we were north of St. Louis, and it was a flood year. And we'd been looking and looking, and finally we saw this, um, um, like a steam shovel over on the edge. It looked like it was abandoned, but I think it was because there was water all around it because of the flood. But right where it was, there was um, a gravel patch. And so we thought, okay, no one's going to be using that steam shovel for, for a while. So we pulled up by that gravel patch and set up our tents. And um, there, it was on an island because the road was underwater. So we were kind of stuck on this island with this steam shovel. And uh, we went to bed that night and there's a huge storm. And all of us, we each have our own tents. All of us were in our own tent trying to hold the four corners down, spread eagle so they didn't blow away. And they didn't. But in the morning, my my two mates came over and said, and our canoe is gone. Oh, no. And I, oh, sure. And they said, yeah, really? And and we got up in our canoe. We had tied it at one end. But, you know, you never think your canoe is going to disappear. We had tied it at one end, but it was completely gone. And there we were on this island with a steam shovel. And everything everything was flooded. So uh, this was before cell phones. There was a dock kind of by the steam shovel that had those black plastic blocks underneath it. And one of those blocks was loose. So I got on that black plastic block and paddled to shore. Our paddles and life jackets and everything was, were still there. Just the canoe was gone. Paddled to shore and tried to find a house where there was someone, but everything was flooded. So that was uh, fruitless. And so I came back, paddled back, balancing on this black cube. And after a while, a fishing boat came by and the guy, you know, we were hooting and hollering at him. And he came over and rescued us. And of course we didn't have a canoe for him to port. It's just our, just our stuff. And he took us to the nearest place that had road access. And that was the St. Louis Yacht Club. Oh, sure. And so we went in this yacht club, all filthy, muddy, you know, no car, no nothing. And, and kind of crashed the, crashed the party. But then one of the girls' husbands came and picked us up there. Uh, so the, 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 the canoe ever turn up? No. And we looked for it for years after that. You know, we thought, oh, it's up in the tree somewhere, bright red. And we'd see these red things in the trees, but they were always the navigation buoys that had broken loose and were up in the trees. So, no, we never did find it. Hmm. The river took it. Yep. Had to buy a new old canoe. <laughs> wow. See, I, it, it's... 
it's easy to forget, like in those days before cell phones, people still found a way to manage, right? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't pretty, but oh, it was a in in retrospect, it's pretty funny. Do you have any other stories you want to share that like uh, things that really impressed you from those trips or great stories about wildlife or anything of that kind? Well, yeah, I'll tell you one story about wildlife. We were going paddling through the University of Minnesota campus. And we had two canoes at that time. And there's people out on the lawn picnicking. And, you know, it was a beautiful day. And there was this huge commotion up in front of us. And it was a duck that was just flapping, flapping and squawking and flying in circles. And I'm really panicking. And we thought, what is wrong with that duck? We got up to her and she had a bunch of babies with her, but under the water, it wasn't very deep, maybe not even two feet at that point. One of her babies had gotten its um, foot stuck in a rock between two rocks underwater. And the baby was down there trying to get loose and the mom was up on the surface try, trying to um, call the baby up to the surface. So one of the girls in the other boat just reached down with her paddle and kind of pried the rock away and the baby shot up into the air and everyone swam away. Yeah, all was well. A little wildlife rescue while you're out there. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Did you see very much wildlife on these trips in general? or We saw tons of birds. To, I mean, it's, it, it's not called the, the flyway for nothing. It's just birds every minute of the day. We saw lots of deer. Uh, we saw some otter. We did not see any bear. Uh, we saw raccoons, but mostly, mostly it was um, birds mm -hmm. and fish and snakes. Plenty of snakes. Yeah. During the so you you had these week long trips over the course of several years. Then, like, how did your if at all like how did your view of the Mississippi change uh, as a result of all those trips? Oh, well the the general flavor of the Mississippi is so different down south. Like I said earlier, it was, it was like paddling in North Dakota at the beginning and, and in central and Southern Minnesota, it was just so pleasant and nice. And then um, down South, the river got so wide that you, you wouldn't even consider crossing from this side to the other side to look at a campsite so far away you couldn't even see if there were campsites on the other side and then the, the boat traffic got so um, ridiculously heavy that it was especially between Baton Rouge and New Orleans it was like a, a death trap in there because there were ocean going um ships coming up to Baton Rouge and there were all the barge trains coming down from Minnesota and all the tugboats crossing um, east to west and west to east and the huge waves that all of those those three things made were just kind of compounding um, against each other so it was it was like being in the North Sea mm. it was it was really scary going through that passage. So the, well, that's, the, about a, that's a good hundred miles, I think, right from Baton Rouge to New Orleans itself. Yeah, it was, it was, it, I can't remember where we stayed between those two, but yeah, it was, it was white knuckling almost that whole stretch. Mm -hmm. And I said to the, when we finally got past all that commotion, um, 
I said something to my to my friends about how harrowing that had been, and they're like, "What? <laughs> what are you talking about?" Because they're up in front, they're just paddling away, and I'm I'm just um, beside myself trying to avoid the waves and the boats and the wind and the oh, I mean it was. For me, that was a terrible experience going through there. Yeah. And then, that's why a lot of that's why a lot of those long distance paddlers choose to go down the Atchafalaya uh, instead of going uh, through Baton Rouge to New Orleans. But yeah, we had uh, some riverboat captains advising us not to do this and not to do that and go this way and that way. And but we did what we what we wanted. Yeah. So did got, you did you end your trip at New Orleans or did you go all the way onto the Gulf? We went all the way to the Gulf, and we got down past Venice, and and then it's just all uh, that's where the road ends. And after that, it's just all these uh, man-made channels. I mean, there's a, a hundred options to get to the Gulf from Venice, and so we just picked one, and and you know, fo followed the map and got out to the ocean. And all of a sudden, all the commotion that we'd been having for 13 years, it just stopped. And we're just floating on this glassy, um, there weren't even any swells or waves or anything. It was just like the world ended. And it was it was such a contrast, and it was um, uh, very emotional for all of us at that point because it's like it. We always drew the analogy to life, you know, that you're you're going through life and all these you have all these problems and situations to solve, and then at the end, it's just peaceful, peaceful and calm and. <laughs> right but it's also like that moment can be kind of bittersweet too right because you've reached the end but but wait this is the end <laughs> yeah. yeah we did have to we camped there on a, this little sandbar made of seashells one night and then we we had to turn around and go back to venice because that's where we were going to get picked up so we you know, paddled back away from the ocean for a day. So we had time to think of everything. Yeah. Well, uh, it seems like you, you you didn't run out of ideas for more adventures when you finished the Mississippi trip, though. Well, actually, I think all three of us were like that last um, that last leg. We took two and a half weeks to do that instead of one week because we said we've got to get this over with we're getting so old and so then we finished and that was it for six years and um i bought a cabin in northern minnesota where i am right now and i thought i'm not i'll go no no more a roving and then um got the bug again so we got out our canoe and and now we're paddling to hudson bay <laughs> wow. That's a very, it seems like that's a very different challenge than the Mississippi. Yeah. There's, yeah, it's, it is different. And in fact, last year was our third and supposed to be our final triumphant year going, reaching the Hudson Bay and we wiped out and we have to go um, <laughs> another year. We're about uh, two weeks from the end. All right. So and what's the route that you're taking for that? Oh, we've been on the Hayes River. We went up the Red River from the, the headwaters at Big Stone Lake between South Dakota and Minnesota. Went up the Red River um, up to Winnipeg and then up Lake Winnipeg. And then on the... Uh, Hayes River to Hudson Bay. So you got to paddle about through your home state again a little bit. Yeah, that was that was funny because on the left side of the river, 
it's just no trees, no um, water, what do you call the, the strip where you try to keep the water from eroding? Well, well not levees, but um, buffer strips along the, the North Dakota side. And the, the fields would come right down to the water. And on the right side of the river, here's all these green trees and grass and buffer strips. And it was very um, different, the two approaches to the Red River. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then you get up into part, you know, you, you probably don't have to go too far into Canada and you're getting to into some pretty remote country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the, we were in the French. Canadian part, which was, I had no idea there was so much uh, French influence right there on the red. All these little towns had their friend, French Catholic churches built right on the river. And all the towns were named French names. So it was like in a, being in a different country there. Mm -hmm. and we hit Lake Winnipeg and that lake is so gorgeous talking about um white sand beaches that whole lake is full of white sand beaches mm. i couldn't have imagined that th that there weren't resorts all up and down that lake because it is so gorgeous mm. and hardly any towns well wow. and the towns there are at least on the north half are all um indian reserve all right. Wow, that is a very different experience. Uh, well, and I know like music has been a big part of your life. When you're on trips like this, do you bring along an instrument, or like is music a part of these trips at all? Music is a huge part of the my two friends and and me when we're canoeing because um, we like to sing, and every every little. Thing reminds us of a song so someone bursts into a song and then everyone joins in and we sing rounds and uh, it's kind of bad because the the people in the front are singing forward I and I in the back can't hear them so I think I'm singing with them but we're all we're really off but even when we stop we like if it's raining we sing and sing but are, no you, are you are you writing your own songs along the way? Or are these like songs that you just know from other places that you're singing? Or mostly camp. Yeah. Can, as a Girl Scout, and we're all of the same age, so we we know yeah. the same. You share a songbook, huh? Yeah, a mental songbook. Well. Uh... Well, Ann, this has been fantastic. I've really uh, enjoyed hearing about your experiences. I know you've got some books that you've written as well. Would you would you like to tell folks a little bit about the books that you've written and where they can find them? Sure. Um, the book about the Mississippi trip is called Mississippi Misadventures, 13 Trips of a Lifetime. And it's written by me, Ann Shervey Osi. And it is available from me, Anne Shiriosi. It's not on Amazon or anywhere else because it's self-published. Um, and I have a website where you can find it. It's annshiriosi.com. I also wrote a book about staying at my cabin through ice up, um, where the the period of the year where you can't get in and you can't get out because the ice isn't thick enough. So it was, I was kind of like a captive in my cabin for 50 days. And the name of that book is um, 50 Days of Exile. Well, Anne, um, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. It was really fun reliving all this stuff. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. I offer the podcast for free, but when you support the show with a few bucks through Patreon, you help keep the program going. Just go to patreon.com slash Dean Klinkenberg.
If you want to know more about the Mississippi River, check out my books. I write the Mississippi Valley Traveler guidebooks for people who want to get to know the Mississippi better. I also write the Frank Dodge Mystery Series that's set in places along the river. Find them wherever books are sold. The Mississippi Valley Traveler podcast is written and produced by me, Dean Klinkenberg. Original music by No Offense. See you next time.